All right, well, one of our uh, Supreme Court justices wrote a note to uh, a prominent bishop. And uh, in that letter, when he wrote to the prominent bishop, he made this prediction. He said, the church is too far gone ever to be redeemed. Can you believe one of our Supreme Court justices would write to a bishop that the church is now too far gone to be redeemed? We're talking about the hope of the church today. Now, this may surprise you, but the guy behind me is the first Supreme Court Justice of the United States. His name is John Marshall. And he was the one that wrote those words to a bishop in his day. Many people down through history have made the prediction that the church has outlived its usefulness. Um, there are secular philosophies and agendas that now prevail. We have grown to an era of enlightenment where we're smarter than what those old scriptures have to say. I mean, would you agree that we still are there where people turn on the news, read the television, and the cutting edge prevailing enlightened thought is that the stuff of God is, well, that was for another time. And we've re reached this new level. I want to let you know, brothers and sisters, be encouraged because the church has endured. And if in the 1790s, in this country, after the American Revolutionary War, when people were moving from those 13 colonies, we had just gotten our, our Constitution in 1789, people were moving west, churches had not been built, and it was estimated, get this, because we think of the good old days of Christianity. One person, no, less than one person in the United States in the late 1700s, early 1800s, less than one person went to church. I mean, these, is, these are like European numbers, and it was out of that environment that John Marshall, he wasn't only a Supreme Court justice, he was the head guy. And he said, we think the church is just about done. He's not the first one to have said that. And we know that there have been eras of church history where we as believers just kind of drop our heads and say, this is not God. We read about the Crusades, and we read about, even in, in modern times, the, the newspapers and, and uh, uh, news agencies, I should say, there's not much being done in newspapers anymore, uh, but the internet, per se, uh, they love to find the story of the fall, do they not, of the, the pastor who fell, or, or the church who siphoned off money for causes that were not true to what the people there have always been, even in the Bible, there have been examples where the church has stumbled and, and, and fall, fallen, and yet it doesn't fail. Amen. You know why it doesn't fail? It doesn't fail because of this, this, these words from Christ in Matthew 16, 18. He's speaking to Peter and the disciples are there and he's telling, he says, Peter, meaning rock, I'm telling you, that on this rock, I will build my church. He doesn't say, you will build my church. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, hell, will not overcome it. If you and I were building the church, she would have died in the first century. She would have never made it out of the first century. If it were all on us to get this thing done, and by the way, what does it mean to get it done? To get it done means we are to shine the light of Christ in such a way that those he is calling, you know the Holy Spirit right now is at work in our communities. He's at work with people that drive by, not just Orchard Ridge, but all the churches of the community. The Holy Spirit is working in the lives of people, calling people to himself. And he will get it done. He will bring in the full number of who he intends to be here. Now, it's his intention. When he died on that cross, did he just die for a handful of the chosen few? Absolutely not. He died for everybody. John 3.16 says, whosoever, right? All of us 
We've all fallen short, and we, are all, uh, we have all been died for by Jesus. And it's his desire that everybody would come in. But you can just stand assured today. We know that we hear stories of Europe and how low church attendance has gotten and all the rest of that. But the real church, I'm going to give you a word here, the ecclesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. I'm not going to give you a big Greek word study on that. But the ecclesia means those who are the called out ones. Ecclesia is where we get the word church. And so the church, the true church, the body of Christ, is found wherever this gospel is preached. The ecclesia is found in the Catholic church. It is found in the Lutheran church. It is found in the Nazarene church and in the Methodist church and right on down the line. And by the way, there are people in all of those churches that might have religion, but they don't have Jesus. In every one of those churches, there are people that that are, uh, they're around it. They're around the things of God, but they have not surrendered in their heart and made Jesus Lord of all. See, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. He doesn't do second place very well. And if you've moved him from last place to second place in your life, not good enough. He says he is to be Lord of all. And so anyone who comes to him, has to come and lay it all down. We lay it down at the foot of the cross, and we say, everything that I am, everything I hope to be, I'm all in for you, Jesus. Now, I, I can speak for myself, and I think I'm speaking for many. Me giving my all to Jesus at the moment when I first meet him, I think I've given him my all. <laughs> and, then, and then comes the day after that happened, and he shows me another area that I haven't given him that. And then there's the next day. And he says, that's all right. You just walk with me. And when I lovingly put a light on an area that you haven't trusted me with yet, I'm now at the, at the apex or the, the intersection of another choice and a decision. Can I now give that thing under his authority and his lordship? Uh, where he sheds his light is where we go. So today I want to talk about the church and the hope, the hope of the church. Um, yesterday, or yeah, it was yesterday. By the way, this, the body of Christ was in great shape this, this Friday and Saturday. Uh, Friday we had a, one of our um, parties that we call set up, and a lot of people attended. And you know, it's actually fun when a lot of people come, and a lot of people were here, and it was good. And then the next day, we had to um, move a lot of our stuff uh, from storage at the Lukenhoff home. I don't, did Doug slip out? He might have, because they're having a grandbaby. And so that's actually a good sign. Let's say a prayer right now for, Lord, we just pray for baby Carter, that uh, we're expected any moment, and we pray for Ricky and Tiffany, Kalel in this new life that's coming into the world, that you would just bless him and uh, bless the Lukenhoffs uh, for their faithfulness to open up their home to us. Amen. Uh, they have been gracious to us, given us their pole barn for the last many years, but they're in the process of uh, selling locally. Thank God they're going to be with us. Uh, but we needed people to step up, and we did. And we had some people that were really good because they were purgers. And how many of you know when you collect stuff through 14 years, some of it's got to go. We had, we had the right mix of guys with power tools, people that were organizers. I just saw little by little by little, every little group doing their thing. And we knocked this, this obstacle out, something I've been dreading for a year, moving that stuff. And it got knocked out from nine to one, and we had a pizza party after, and it was, it was just a good time. Body of Christ in full display. When I was leaving there, we were, uh, I was shooting a text, and I think it was to John Camus, and uh, where's Brock? He's over here. Was it three days ago, I get this text from Brock, and apparently Brock has, we all know what a semi-truck looks like. You've got the truck and then the big wagon at the back of it, the 18-wheeler part that they put cargo all over the country through. How he got one of those, I don't know. He doesn't have the part that pulls it, but he's got the back part. And it's at his property, 
And the township says, you can't have that thing there. I don't know why. You know, wouldn't you want your next door neighbor to have a semi-truck in its, in its backyard? I don't know. For some reason, they don't want him to have that. And so he said, hey, I'll give it to the church. He didn't even know, I don't think, about all of our, our space needs and whatever. So at some point, we're going to get that over to the church property, tucked away, hidden somehow, some way, and hopefully the township won't say something to us. But <laughs> the good news is, so we had this place that, that we, could, we could store this, this stuff. And I shot that picture over, I think, to John, and Gabe, Gabe got that as well. And they were like, wow, that's timely. That's amazing. That's, I said, you know what? This church, for 14 years, it's just been like that. Like, whenever something comes to the end of the road, God always opens up another thing. And when, when the last school closed off, this opened up. And when the ministry center uh, closed up, then he opened up. It, it's just been he has provided not more than we need, but everything we need, and right on time. You know our God is an on-time God? Let me tell you how on time he is. This blew me away too. One of my classmates from the, the class of 1987 put on Facebook, hey everybody, class of 87, Warren Woods Tower, uh, we graduated on this day 30 years ago. This was June the 2nd, okay? June the 2nd was the day of my first date with Sharon. And I looked at that and I'm like, wow, I graduated high school on June the 2nd, 1987. And exactly to the day, four years later, God introduced to me the woman who would be my wife, mother of my children, love of my life, all that stuff, came into my life four years to the day of my high school graduation. He introduced her into my world. I'm like, yeah, that's probably just coincidence as I had been praying all through college that at the right time, God would bring this person in. And again, just saying, he's an on-time God. And so I, with these guys, I said uh, sarcastically somewhat, I said, John, for some reason, God just won't let this church die. And I love John's response. He said, and I won't let it die either. And I love that he, he said, I won't let this church die died, his passion for it, but the Lord Jesus Christ will not let his church die. In the church, the true church, the ecclesia that is made up of believers in every church, true believers, they're not going anywhere. And if God can take stones and make bread, if God can take dry bones in the Old Testament and, and put flesh on them and make an army out of them as we read in the pages of the Old Testament. You better believe he will raise up for himself a church. And he says to Peter, he says, on this rock I'm going to build, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. So what is the hope of the church? It's this, that we're not in charge of making it happen. The Lord will build his church. What's our role then in that? We get to decide by our own free will choice whether or not we will participate in that. You know, it's a, it's a privilege to participate. If there were a king on earth, or let's just say the president were to call you, irrespective of your politics, I think most of us, if the president of the United States called you and said so-and-so, there's something going on in your area, and I'm, I'm personally asking you, to serve and to give and to, to do this thing. I think most of us, uh, I, I can say this no matter who the president is, what party, as long as it did not violate my, my conviction of heart and my, my primary uh, obedience to the Lord, if my president asked me to do something, I would say, wow, I am humbled that I get to do this thing for the United, serve my country because the president has asked me to do it. How much more is it that when Jesus says, you have gifts, you have talents, you have abilities, and he calls you and he says, I have raised you up for such a time as this to get this thing done. And that thing that needs to be get done might be Jennifer Robertson, 
stepping in for Francine, doing the nursery for such a time as this, saying, yes, I'll do it. And Mary did that. And Rebecca, the many people that stepped up and did that, they did that because their king, much higher than the president of the United States, said, we need you right now for such a time as this. See, the ones that stay to the periphery of the life of the ecclesia, they may think that they're avoiding whatever this is and thinking this is not good. But the reality of it is there is blessing. I was blessed yesterday when I stepped away and we walked away and I looked at those two storage units. It, at best, I thought we were just going to throw that stuff in there and pull the door shut and forget about it, walk away. I was just really dreading this day. But when it was all done, I had watched a solid, sizable team from this congregation not only get that stuff transferred, but shelves and color organization and that stuff over there needs to be thrown away, Pastor Steve. And it was organized and it was good. And I said, wow, this body of Christ thing is awesome when it works and when people come together. And yeah, praise God for that. Um, and there are many ways that we serve. Some are on prayer teams, some help with the finances. You know, there's people that serve uh, the church, the ecclesia, you'll never know about it. And so it's very important that none of us get judgmental and say, well, I do this all the time. I, that person over there, they don't do anything. We don't know that. So don't assume ever uh, that that is the case. Um, said all that to say, this thing about we as the church, just as, as the church will not be destroyed. Have you ever noticed, has it ever been lost on you that Israel, this tiny little nation, by the way, we have four spaces left for 2018, just a little side note. This little nation in the Middle East and its people, Israel is really a people group more than its borders, because Israel existed for the last 2,000 years, but they didn't have a homeland. So too the church. We are, a, the church is us, it's the people. But Israel, this people group, um, you know the most recent history, you know, you know the Nazis, you know concentration camps, you know Auschwitz. But if you think that's the only time in the last 2,000 years that this people group has been persecuted, that people have not had desires to wipe them off the face of the earth. This goes back to before the time Jesus was born. Have you read the book of Esther? Have you read how the Persians, uh, Haman, wanted to destroy every single Jew off of the face of the earth? There is a spirit of Antichrist that hates the Jews and wants them gone, wants them obliterated. And even the church, quote unquote, not the real church, but the church at the time that was leading Spanish Inquisition and burning Jews at the stake if they didn't convert over to Christianity. Horrible things. Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union killing more Jews than Hitler killed. And you say, why, why would the world go after one group of people? And, and mind you, a people that have contributed greatly to the world through science and technology and music. Look at the contributions of the Jewish people. And why would there just be this anti-Semitic fervor that would hate this group of people? Let me tell you, if anything proves that this is true, just look at that. And that's not in your Bible. That's in your history books. Somebody out there wants this people gone. And the same thing can be said of the church. We enjoy freedoms in the church in this country. We don't know what persecution is. If you think persecution is somebody calls you a Jesus freak, you have no idea what, we don't have any idea what persecution is. But the church of Jesus Christ globally, Voice of the Martyrs tells us that more people have died just in the last 100 years, 120 years, than all the other 1,900 years combined for the sake of, of Christ. And so we know that these things are alive and well. But just as God will not let Israel die, he will not let his church die. Matthew 5, 14, we know that is the Sermon on the Mount, this little section where Jesus talks about you are the, the salt of the world, you are the light of the world. There's one particular verse 
just want to just highlight this momentarily. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. In Psalms 119, King David, he, he talked about the word of God in, in Psalm 119. I think it's the largest chapter in the entire Bible. And it's all about the word of God. Come back the last Sunday of June, and I want to talk to you about the hope that's found right here in the Word. We're going to talk about the Word. And we're also going to find out which part of the Word we're going to translate for a people group in the world. Uh, we're going to be a part of that effort to do some Bible translation. We're not doing that. We don't have the ability. We're going to, we're going to fund it so that it happens. Psalm 119, verse 130 says, The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Light. Why are, why are we, the church, here? Last week, I think, or the week before, we talked about how hope, really hope is help. And hope that is deposited in you, like a, in a bank account. Hope that gets deposited in you, which is what the Lord does to us when we receive him. That deposit is not so our hope bank account can grow, 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 grow. Hope is given to you so that it might be transferred and given out side to side laterally to people that are around us. And that, that hope transferred comes through the form of help to other uh, people groups. And so the real question is for the hope of the world, I, I've heard there's a large church in our nation uh, that I've heard its pastor, and I have a lot of respect for this pastor, but I just respectfully disagree slightly with one thing that, that he says. He says the church is the hope of the world. He says he believes that the church is the hope of the world. I believe that what the church gives out, meaning Jesus, is the hope of the world. The Lord said, I will build my church. The church is an outgrowth of, of the desire of God. The whole reason that the church is here is because Jesus said, I desire a bride. I desire a church. And so I will build, I will create my church. And whatever God creates, he will fund it. He will give it. He will provide everything that church needs. So what is my hope for Orchard Ridge? As long as we're walking with Jesus, we're going to be just fine here. We will do everything that God intends for us to do right here if we keep looking to who our benefactor is. Who are we doing this for? Who is the one who is funding it? How is it happening? If this is all for Jesus, if everything we do is for Jesus. Now, if we turn this into some, some social club, if we turn this into something that isn't what Christ intended the church to be, then God only knows what will happen to Orchard Ridge. But if we're walking with him, if we're doing the things that he said a church should be doing, if we're listening for his voice, if we're not rushing off into quick decisions without seeking his help, I have no worries for Orchard Ridge Church. We have a great hope right here because he will guide us through everything that has to be made. I want to go back for a second to that, that time in American history. You don't see too many westerns being made anymore. Have you ever noticed that? Like in the movies, I, I, when's the last time you've seen like a movie from the era of like, or, you know, like the John Wayne movies or, or the comedies that were on TV like F Troop. Anybody ever remember F Troop? Right? It was like a fort out like during the Colonel Custer times that was out in the west because people were leaving the eastern part of the United States and they were going west. The problem was... They were getting west so fast that law and order hadn't caught up yet. I mean, people were, and the government wanted them to go west. You want to know why? Because occupation of the land it gave us priority on that land over Mexico, other, over other nations that wanted to lay claim to it. There were people, when the gold rush happened, Russia was coming over here, the Chinese, a lot of people were coming wanting to lay claim to land. So the U.S. government in Washington was encouraging people, go west, go west. And they were. But there were perils out there. There were conflicts with Native American tribes that had been here for centuries. And when you get out to an area and there is no law, I thank God for the police in this country. I thank God for people 
that we, that we have a system of order whereby if there is a crime, there, is, there are people to keep that in check. Because the heart of mankind, if you throw them out, will not only see the best of mankind, we will see the worst. And this is where the stories of Jesse James and all these other outlaw groups happened in the West. Because there was no law and order yet. It hadn't gotten out there. And there was this thing. Do you remember it? It was like a fort. It was the tall wood side, and up in the corners they would have, you know, the lookout spots, and their uniforms of the cavalry were like the Civil War uniforms, and, and they had their bugles and all that. That little outpost, which were at various places in the western United States, those were places of great hope. If you were, if you were an American that had come, traveled west in a covered wagon, and there were all the things out there that could harm you, whether it be outlaws or whether it be uh, Native American groups that felt threatened by your presence, if you could just know where those outposts were, if you could get there and you could get within the protective walls of that structure, you were safe. What is the church? We know that's what we are. That's what we are. We, Orchard Ridge exists. Not, not per se the building of the four walls of that, although that, there's, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, I can't tell you how many times when I was at the Woods Church that somebody just came in off the street without hope, suicidal, on their last gasp of ready to take it all and just be done with it. And only by the grace of God, because there was a church on a piece of land that was open, that they could come in and say, would somebody help me? I, I, I don't, I'm about ready to, to hurt myself. I need some help here. Um, and so there is some literal truth to the idea of four walls and why we need to uh, take a look to your left and to your right. And I want you to notice on both of those images uh, that there is a large middle square, rectangular. And then there are some, some other things that are shooting off of the big, large, rectangular thing in the middle. And uh, you will be hearing from us very, very soon, uh, these good people right up here, pray for them this weekend. They have a big wedding. Their daughter is getting married. But very, very soon, you're going to hear what's going on with all that. We may have to phase. Uh, we may have to build that big, big box first and figure out a way to worship in that middle part. But one way or another, when we ring that bell and get to the top of that thermometer, can I just tell you, we have never been closer than we are right now. And I, I believe it in my heart and my spirit. We're not far off from getting our, our, at least our first footprint out there on that property, something that we can worship in. So um, our hope isn't in that building. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. We will worship here as long as he says to worship here. And we will be fine with that. But that day is coming. I say all that to say, what are we? I give you that, that image of that, that fort to know that the church is a place where people can come. In a perilous world where there are, there are elements outside of the walls of the church that are not good. We know that, don't we? I mean, everything from what our youth are up against, what our children are up against. And we exist as a place uh, not only that people come in, but that, watch, the light shines out. It's a bad imagery. What I just gave you is not a good imagery if we stop at the fort concept. You want to know why? So people have that mindset that the church just get inside the walls, get out from out there, come on in here, be safe, and then let whatever happens out there, who cares? No, we're, we're a place of safety, but we, we come together today so that we can be sent, so that we can leave here today and to go out. And in that regard, we take the light. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And then that phrase, a city on a hill or a town built on a hill, cannot be hidden. If you've ever traveled, uh, you know, from this area down to Detroit, as you get closer, you see light, and it starts to light up because the city lights are there. We are a city on a hill, and we are here to reflect the hope of Christ that is the one thing that can change them. On that far left side for you, would you read this verse? A portion of it is printed up there. You also, 
Peter, this is Peter writing this after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. He said, you also, talking to the church, like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him, meaning Jesus, will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble in a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. What is my role? What is your role in, the, in this church, in this ecclesia? Do you remember the story of the woman that came uh, just very shortly before Jesus was crucified? Do you remember that story how um, she took that perfume? It was very, very expensive. And she poured it out and anointed Christ. Some of the, the, the disciples led by Judas were indignant and they said, what a waste of money. We could have done this and this and this with, with that. Jesus, uh, he says something that is really insightful for all of us because some of us think, well, I, physically I can't lift boxes on a move day like they did yesterday. I, I can't stack chairs. I can't, I can't do this, 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 and this because of this, 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 and this. And we, we begin to feel hopeless. Listen to what he says here. This is so good. In Mark 14, 8, Jesus talking about that woman who poured out that perfume. He says, she did what she could. She did what she could. And go on and read, she poured perfume on my body before I had to prepare for burial. She did what she could. You know who knows what you can do? Really only you. Are you being obedient with what you can do? Um, she did what she could. She had the perfume. Maybe the lady down the street didn't have the perfume. It was a valuable thing. Uh, how are we going to get that thermometer to go to the top when we do what we could? You know, sometimes I'm blessed. Uh, we're given a report every week about what the finances is. And sometimes I'll see where it says building fund, $25. And on the surface, that may seem, oh, that's terrible. We're never going to get there if... $25 coming in on the building fund on a Sunday. But when I see that, this is what I know. I don't know who gave the 20 I don't know who gives whatever they give. But I see that and I see building fund on such a Sunday. $25. You know what that tells me? That tells me that somebody said, I'm going to do what I can do. Do you think that when whoever that was, when they said $25 building fund, do you think that they were thinking, this will build the church really, really soon. They weren't thinking that, but they were thinking, what can I do? What can I do? Not that we need to get 100,000, 200,000, whatever it is left. They're saying, wait a second. I'm a part of the ecclesia. What can I do? If I can't give a sizable amount, what can I do? And it says in the word, Jesus told the disciples, listen, she did what she could do, and that's why her sacrifice will be remembered wherever this gospel is preached. For some of you that can do here, and you're doing here, and being here may seem to this one like you're doing a lot, but you can do this. You wrestle with the good Lord about are you doing what you can do? Only you know what you can do. I don't know what you can do. But let's not get caught up in, in defining success in our own personal lives. And this isn't just about money. It's about every area of our lives, our time, our talents, our treasure. Are we being faithful with what we can do? You're in a season where you can't give anything. Then you're digging in the seat cushions and you bring five bucks. I think one of the finest hours, and it's time and I see it, and we're going to stop. One of the finest hours of this ecclesia, of this church, was in 2009, and it was Christmas time. We had just made uh, the purchase of the land, but we were, 
think we were $42,000 away from a full payoff. Some of you remember this. We had red legal envelopes. And for the whole month of December, we had those at the exits. And we told everybody. You know, the church was started at Christmas time. Um, we were going to, we had a manger right in front of the pulpit at the front of the school. Put hay in there, the whole nine yards. And I asked the church, I said, listen, on Christmas Sunday, I'm asking every one of you to take that red envelope home. And I don't care, we can all afford a dollar. I don't care how poverty stricken you are, go collect pop cans and get a dollar. But I said, I'm just, I'm not asking you to give a certain amount, but I'm asking for 100% participation. Every family, every man, woman, boy, and girl, on that day that we all get up and hold a red envelope, that only you know what is in there. You do what you can do. And we're going to file up here like we do at communion time, and we're all going to drop these red envelopes into that manger where Jesus came into the world. We're going to just put it right there. We did that that day. And I, we needed 42000 to pay it off. By the way, that wasn't even in my mind of that being the goal. I just thought we'd make some money for the building program. That, that's all it was. We added it up that day, and I think we went $2,000 or thereabouts over what we needed to pay off the land in full. Those red envelopes had 40 Fourth out, whatever it was, we paid that land off on the one day. Why? Because of that verse there. She did what she could. And everybody on that day was honest about what they could do. And they were faithful to that. We didn't even tell them the amount that we needed to pay it off. Do you think it was coincidence that the amount that came here was enough to be there? That was a God moment. I've needed those moments. Some of you, we've needed those moments to know he's with us. We're, he's in this. We're, he's still with us. Keep marching. Don't lose hope. Um, so praise be to God. All right, well, I'm going to ask our, our, our band to come forward. I'm going to summarize. There's a story here that's just, I'm going to use it in our, in our closing. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to paraphrase it. It's, a, it's an illustration, a true life illustration. I think we have some images from the 1929 Rose Bowl, back when they didn't wear face masks. 1929 was the year that the stock market crashed. We were going into the Great Depression. The Roaring Twenties was coming to a catastrophic end. And Georgia Tech was playing um, University of California, Berkeley, in the Rose Bowl. And there was a player on the UC Berkeley team that in the first half he recovered a fumble, which is a good thing. Defensive player scooping up a fumble is a good thing. However, he started running the wrong way. That's not a good thing. When you pick up the ball, you want to go towards your end zone and not help the other team out by running into their end zone, which would have given them a safety if you know the rules of football. And so Roy Regals starts booking down the side, Ryan, the, the wrong way. Thank God for his teammate. Um, that chased him down and thankfully before he went into the end zone for that safety got him corralled and you know stopped here is this college player that is so young he's you know whatever he is 18 19 20 21 he's been humiliated by everyone in that stadium it was right before the halftime nothing ever came of it they went into the half and the coach is thinking what do I say here you know what what do I say? Roy Ringles went in the corner. The whole team was huddled up around the coach at halftime. This is how it's, the story's told. Roy got a towel, threw it over his head, and went in the corner and was sobbing like a baby. This big old guy, he was humiliated, he was crying. Coach just started to give a few pointers of this and that. And right at the end, when it was three minutes, the officials came in, three minutes to go, we gotta go back out there, gave him the warning. Coach said, all right. Everybody who started the first half is going to start the second half. That was code for Roy. We're st we still believing you. We still want you out there. They all got up ready to go and, and, and took the field, except for Roy. He was still crying in the corner with his towel. Coach looks at him and goes up to him and says, Roy, did you hear what I said? 
um, you're in. I said, Coach, I let down you. I let down myself. I let down my family, my school. There's no way. I'm such a failure. There's no way I can go back out there. Find somebody else to put me in. Coach looked him in the eye and he said, you listen to me. We still have a half of football to play. We believe in you and I want you out there playing. Roy pulled it together and Coach later wrote, I've never seen a player play football like Roy Regals played in the second half of the 1929 Rose Bowl. He was everywhere. He was flying around. He played with a passion that people just don't have. Where am I going with that? I don't know where you're at, Christian, in the area of this journey of your life. A lot of us have been running the wrong way for way too long. And we want to say, what help am I to the ecclesia? What help am I to the Lord's church? I can't do it. I've humiliated myself. I've got this in my, in my past, and I've got that in my past, and I just would rather sit in the corner and cry. I'm telling you, your heavenly father, your coach, looks at you, and he says, he says either that was the first quarter, or it's halftime, or some of you, maybe it's the two-minute warning, and the better part of your life is over, but you can go out there and play the game of life with Jesus better than you've ever played it before. If you make the decision to go out and forget about what has been and look and focus on what will be. Amen? Let's pray. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the, the gift of the church. And for those that would say, I don't need the church. It's, got, it's full of hypocrites. All this other stuff that we hear. Lord, I, I see a church with imperfect people but I see a church of people that love you and love one another. And even with our misunderstandings, even with our misgivings, there's no other group of people that I choose to do life with than the people of the church of Jesus Christ. And I thank you for the church. I thank you for it. God, you desire for us to be living stones. You want to build your church, not with brick and mortar. But we want the people within the brick and mortar at 30 Mile and Mound. We want those people to be living stones. People that take the towel and wipe the tears away of the first half and say, okay, I don't know how much time I got left, but I'm going to be flying all over that field making plays for Jesus. And if flying all over the place means I'm on my knees praying, then I'm going to be a prayer warrior for Jesus. Whatever I can be, that's what I'm going to be. I'm going to find my place and I am going to serve. Build this church, Jesus, with living stones. Build us with living stones. And may we be a people that can say, I'm doing what I can. I'm doing what I can. So that we can hear you say one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, if there's somebody here, uh, they, haven't been, they haven't received the Spirit of God. You've been a part of their life, but not the Lord of their life. I pray right now that we would confess our sin to you, that we would repent of that, and we would simply, by a prayer of faith, say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me for what has been. And captain my ship moving forward to what will be. And I will walk with you. And as you shed light in my life, I will do the best I can to be obedient to that. And I pray that my life would produce a lot of fruit for you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.